elections, as, as it has been the case for the past decades. The second thing that will come in is, of course, digitalization. Um, we will see a new mix of physical encounters, of digital formats, of hybrid formats. And it's nothing that I fear. It's actually something that I hope for, because we all know we are all under the impression of the debate of sustainability in all spheres of public life. Uh, and of course, sustainability will become a dominant factor when it comes to the internationalization of the future. And of course, you can only become more sustainable if you factor in digital formats, hybrid formats, use them wherever they can be utilized. What I see, for example, is that when you meet with your partners in a network that has already been in place for five to 10 years, people know each other, why not meet up digitally to discuss the progress of the project, to discuss the next milestones and the roadmap ahead. You need not come together for 24 hours with transcontinental, intercontinental flights from all over the world to say Germany. So this is something that, that will play a much more important role in the future. And a third thing, and that has already been uh, mentioned by um, media as well, um, I think we will see an acceleration of the development from bilateral partnerships to multilateral networks. And what we also saw in the pandemic, by the way, is when we have stable multilateral networks in place, strategic partnerships of two, three, four, five universities worldwide, then they have displayed a much higher level of resilience, if you so wish, than networks that have just been launched and a much stronger level, higher level of resilience than bilateral partnerships. If you are working together in a multilateral network and people know each other and people are committed to this strategically and in the long term, then these partnerships, these networks are much more resilient than others. And this will, I think, be a very strong factor in the future going for long term partnerships, going for um, sustainable networks. Um, perhaps I have I have labeled this in some other context as perhaps the next level from strategic partnerships to institutional friendships so that you have institutions that are committed to each other in such a way that they work together for you know a long term period for the entire future and um, in a multilateral network ideally so these are some of the changes we will see in the 2020s um, and we should work together to uh, prepare ourselves for this future. Um, after the pandemic, we will not see a return to the mobility world of 2019, definitely not. But that will not mean that, you know, the desire for physical encounters will be entirely replaced and replaceable by digital formats either. Yeah, thank you. Thank you uh, uh, so much. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Kamalka, being vice chancellor of Indian University, and yeah, I think that the, the, the topic of the networks is really interesting. No, as we know, there's a lot of things ongoing, digital networking. So, what, what's your take on that? Will we see more networks and will we step away from this all bilateral model, university to university? Yeah. Thank you, first of all, although I'm sorry that I joined a bit late, uh, some issue. Anyway, but I'm there. Uh, the University of Pune basically is a state university, public state university, and uh, a very large structure, more than half a million students basically getting graduated, getting enrolled for their graduation. And in that, initially, we had uh, some, I would say, not bilateral, basically, uh, more networking, uh, especially the Euroculture program that was running on the campus, wherein there were a couple of universities which were involved. But actually, the uh, the the exchange was uh, one-sided, sort of, uh, from one end only. Most of the time, it is the European student they were coming down uh, for study over here, maybe for a semester or uh, two semester or more. Uh, then subsequently, that program is no more uh, on presently. 
but we are looking to basically as rightly been pointed out more multidisciplinary partners multidisciplinary area where we are trying to engage with uh, presently there are a couple of program that we are running with uh, only one nation perhaps the best example would be we are running a, a blended bsc program with uh, melbourne university and that's in the blended form so obviously most of the time the teachers from the melbourne they come down for teaching purpose and the student get a chance but not uh, throughout the three years, maybe at the end of the uh, their graduation program, a semester they spend at the Melbourne University. Something similar we are working with the Drexel University in the United States of America, wherein it's a post graduation program, one year in India and one year perhaps abroad. But uh, uh, presently, in fact, uh, one more program that uh, we are working with uh, that is more of a research program, wherein there are multi universities been involved, and, and that's basically universities from Spain, university from India, university from uh, basically Southeast Asian part as such. So that is how things are happening as such. And perhaps uh, I'm looking uh, basically uh, at the backdrop, backdrop of the new education policy that uh, more emphasis, uh, emphasis has been provided on multidisciplinarity. So perhaps um, many partners uh, coming together and working on uh, a particular issue that perhaps would be the near future. Sorry. Yeah, thank, thank you for that insight. You mentioned the new education policy, and I think and, and networks. And I think here is a uh, question I would like to take up for Professor Mukashin um, uh, for media for you. So yesterday we had a quite interesting talk uh, from Raj Kumar about the democratization of international education in India, and he argued very strong that we need more institutions enabled for internationalization, that we need to strengthen and to broaden the network. And I also know, of course, that within the DAD, we are having a huge discussion on diversity on individual level, but also on diversification of institutions who participate in internationalization. So what we will see, is there a need, or should we continue to focus on high excellence institutions, like the institutions of eminence who receive funding, or the institutions of the excellence in its initiative who are receiving a lot of funding for internationalization? What would be your take on it, Lydia? Yeah, so I think I would tend to agree with Raj because uh, he and I have been strong proponents of democratization of internationalization and not really limited to the elite class of institutions and only look at institutions of eminence in our country or world class universities elsewhere from Europe, Australia or, or America because Finally, you know, it's like a marriage. It's going to be with like minded people and it can't be, you know, that one person, one spouse is, uh, you know, up, up there and the other one somewhere else, you know, so you have to be equals, uh, you, you know, in any kind of network or collaboration. And I think it's, uh, it's also to do with the kind of, uh, you know, the mindsets, I would say, of people in the universities, you know, the disciplines that you want to really collaborate with. So, I wouldn't really, you know, run after some institutions of eminence uh, from across the world, but really look at how compatible is the other institution with mine and how, you know, how compatible are faculty with each other? Because I think uh, collaborations or networks have to emerge from bottoms up and not from a top down approach. You know, you can't sit as vice chancellors and university administrators and say that, you know, these are universities that you must collaborate with because they're world class. It can never happen like that. It has to happen at the level of the faculty where they find, you know, like minded partners. Uh, people who are working in the same discipline, students who can actually be brought together. And I think here faculty play a key role. And therefore, I would really subscribe that internationalization and through the various networks, we need to internationalize more and more universities. Unfortunately, in India, a handful of us are really very strong in internationalization. And therefore, this new education policy, which is dedicated a whole chapter in internationalization, and uh, both me and Dr. Karmarkar have been part of these discussions and where we've again promoted saying that it's not just the, you know, the Savitri Bhai Phule Pune University or the Symbiosis International or the Ashoka or the OP Jindal that, you know, are those uh, elite, uh, you know, islands of excellence for internationalization, but it should spread across across the country. I mean, why shouldn't even universities that are, you know, in some rural part of India, not internationalized? Why can't they have foreign students? Because, you know, some someone from a remote play, a rural area in Germany can actually look at some common problems that they can, you know, find so much of similarity and teachers can come together and find solutions. So I, I would really uh, expect that with the new education policy, with the kind of dual degrees and joint degrees that are going to be encouraged and promoted, uh, you know, and we are really driving this very 
very, very hard from the, the policy makers, from the government of India, ministry, as well as UGC, as well as, you know, uh, the, the FIKI, uh, because we, we actually have a committee on implementation of internationalization, uh, you know, as a part of NEP, and I've been fortunate enough to be a member of the committee, and this is exactly what we've said. We've said that let's democratize, let's have more and more institutions of ours, uh, you know, come forward and say that we are willing to accept foreign faculty, we're willing to send in our students, we're willing to send in our teachers. And I'm sure Katya, in years to come, at least by 2030, we'll see a large number of Indian institutions willing to accept foreign students and even willing to send their teachers and students across borders. Yeah, thank you so much, Lydia. But I think it's not just the it's not just the Indian universities in is in to democratize. So I I mean if I look at the, the, the cooperation between India and Germany, for instance, there's 50 40, 50 German institutions who uh, in, into the Indian market, let me put it that way. So, Mr. Mukherjee, what is the take on the DID? Shouldn't we also not be more open and also offering more possibilities uh, also for smaller universities in Germany? Well, we do exactly that. Let me remind everyone here, perhaps not everyone is aware of the fact that the DID is not, we are not a government body. We are a free association of all German universities. And uh, our members are the German universities, big universities, top universities, whatever top means, um, and also small universities, specialized universities, universities of applied sciences, for the arts, for music, they all are our members. So our policy is always mapped on the strategy uh, defined and desired by all our members. And so, I'm not, I'm not that much of a fan of all these eminence and excellence concepts. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I think it's always a matter of eye level, shared interests, joint projects. Um, and like in an Indian arranged marriage, it has to, it has to work. It has to work. Um, and I, I may take my own university uh, as, a, as an example. Um, my own university is amongst the top 400 and times higher. Uh, it's not a top 10 and not a top 50 university worldwide, but we do have niches and pockets of excellence, and we do have strategic partners worldwide. We have, on the one hand, the University of Medicine as a strategic partner, and the Monash and Monash University as a strategic partner. So these are top universities because there is a shared interest in joint projects. In some of the areas, we have a clear um, expertise and also excellence, and that makes us an interesting partner. On the other hand, we have partners in the Global South, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where, of course, we have a more, more of a giving function, where we you know, develop structures, and this is also part of our responsibility. Uh, and there is also a joint interest, a shared interest in joint projects. So what I want to say is, it's not so much about the top 10 and the top 20. Um, what I always hear from everywhere in the world, be it in Russia, be it in African countries, be it in Latin America, be it in Singapore, everyone wants to work together with the top 10 universities in Germany. Um, for one, we have a very high level of quality in research and teaching in Germany across all universities. And that's one of our strengths. And two, it is mathematically impossible to bring together 1,000 universities worldwide with 10 universities in Germany. And this is something we have to accept. And it's not so much about rankings and top to top. It's about shared interests, a shared responsibility, joint projects, and the internationalization. And I'm, uh, I wholeheartedly agree with Lydia here. It's about internationalization of the entire system. And the system is not just the top 10. The system is the entire system of universities of higher education institutions. And we as DAD, given that we are a membership or association and organization, that all of the German universities are our members, are really committed to this core idea. We want to provide a platform for, and we want to contribute to, the internationalization of all institutions of higher education, because we know that internationalization is always a key factor to become 
more um, more competitive, more successful, and is a major factor when you want to excel in research and teaching. And that not that does not apply to a few institutions at the top only. That applies to all institutions, and that must be our joint um, endeavor. Thank you so much for this encouraging words. Also, I think for smaller institutions to enter the, the game, let, let me put it that way, and to, to internationalize. Uh, we also tackle the problem of digitalization, which is closely linked to sustainability and uh, yeah, to the climate change, uh, a big topic. So, uh, Professor Kalmaka, how do you see the discussion on sustainability in India, which is a huge discussion? Now we have the smart city programs by the government. Uh, SDGs is a, is, a, is a huge topic in India, uh, also the SDG 4 for um, uh, education. Uh, so how you see will that influence the international uh, exchange? Will we all stay grounded and just cooperate digital? Um, uh, or will there be also um, movements in the future and how, uh, which are the topics one should address in, in this field? Thank you. In fact, it has started happening physically. Uh, we have a program with the uh, with the uh, Norway government, wherein basically uh, there is a there is a work that has been happening, or rather addressing uh, problems related to the uh, climate challenges as such. So whether it is water, whether it is soil, and the, apart from that, basically even to a great extent the agriculture part as such. Well. So we've been working together, and there are three universities from Norway and uh, uh, Pune University together. We've been working on these various different issues as such. Uh, rest of the uh, um, uh, the other part, basically, we aren't uh, actually still not engaged with, especially with the German university in this particular arena as such. But there is a plenty of scope, in fact, I would say. And digitalization, yes, absolutely. Uh, the COVID has provided this particular opportunity. We, in fact, uh, in recent times, have started uh, a platform, what is called the degree plus. And wherein, in fact, we are bringing in many such courses on various different aspects, including basically the climate challenge, uh, challenge as such. So there is a possibility of, in fact, going more or in a broader way, making use of this particular new uh, new sort of a technology or new sort of a uh, um, 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 methodology that is online education. But physical, uh, you cannot replace it because certain areas you need to physically visit and see especially when it comes to climate, obviously, uh, you need to work in a physical mode as such. Yeah, thank you so much and for highlighting that, of course, physical mobility is just one aspect of, of sustainability. Vidya, in an article last year you, for the AIU, you called for global citizenship as a facilitator for sustainability. No, you were a strong advocate for that. Is this the main contribution international education should have to form global citizens who then solve and sort the challenges which we are ahead of us as humankind? I, I'm a strong and a very, very strong proponent of global citizenship because finally internationalization for what? You know, internationalization for producing global citizenship and I, it's not just global citizens, but global citizenship, which means that every human being, every young man and woman that enters the portals of the university should respect cultures, should be, you know, respect diversity, should be inclusive, and more importantly, you know, look at sustainability as one of the most important parameters. And I, I, I would definitely say that internationalization is actually for a much larger cause than really look at, you know, how many teachers are mobile, how many students are mobile, what kind of curriculum uh, that you have internationalized, or how many joint collaborations do you have, or how much of joint research do you do? I mean, I think it is to change the mindsets of these young men and women to respect cultures and diversity. That's the larger picture. You know, so when you when you send students abroad, what is it that they really gain? Is it that they just enter a foreign land and sit in a foreign classroom with, you know, with different students? Or is it that they learn diversity by looking at different discussions that happen through, uh, you know, students from different regions? Uh, why do we want to have foreign students in our classrooms? It's not just about the numbers, but it's about the diverse discussions that happen in these classrooms. Why do you need foreign faculty? Because they are the ones who are going to teach your students what is happening in another part of the world and how do you respect that diversity and those discussions? 
I think Atya, that is the larger picture and I've been a very, very strong proponent. And let me tell you that the University Grants Commission, which is the highest apex body of the government of India that governs all the universities, has created a group to see how global citizenship can be embedded as a part of the curriculum. Uh, fortunately, again, I'm on that group. And the motto of our university, if you look at here on my left, is Vasudaiva Kutumbakam. This is an age-old concept of Indian mythology, which speaks about the world being one family. And that is exactly what the whole motto is, that how do you bring in students from different regions, different parts of the world, to believe that this whole planet, this whole earth, the whole world is one family. And we all live together to coexist, to respect not just human beings of different cultures, but even plants, animals, and everything around you. So, uh, uh, yes, what you say is right, that I have been a strong proponent of this terminology. So, global citizenship as facilitator for sustainability. I think you tackled also the, the topic of diversity, uh, which was actually not foreseen for the discussion, but nevertheless, uh, Professor Mugati, uh, we have ongoing discussions in German universities on diversity and sustainability, also within the DAD who published a, a paper. Uh, so what would be the take, how one should see it, it's, because it's not just about the CO2 footprint of all us traveling. Oh, that, that makes things even more uh, complicated. I in my uh, last um, remark, I uh, talked about the diversity of institutions, if you so wish, and the fact that we have to consider all institutions as valuable actors in the business of internationalization. And of course, the same is true for people. Um, we have a, and thank God, we have a rich diversity of people with different talents, with different competencies, um, also with different, um, let me say, prerequisites um, for an academic career. We have first generation students. We have, um, um, so a rich field of people that we would have to accommodate in the higher education system. Um, for Germany, for example, we have to accept today and we actually embrace that also positively that 60%, almost 60% of a cohort leaving school with A-levels enrolls at the university. So this is a much more diverse student population than in the days when I studied or than in the days when the generation before me studied 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. So all of them need international experience. All of them need intercultural encounters. All of them need a global perspective on the world. All of them need a change of perspective. And of course, what we can't do is, and that brings me to sustainability, what we can't do is we can't put 2.9 million students, this is the number of German students enrolled at German universities, we can't put all of them into an airplane, send them off to another continent um, for reasons of sustainability. And even 50% of them, if we want to provide them with an international experience, that's, by the way, uh, a goal set by the German government. 50% of all German students should gain an international experience, in brackets, by a physical encounter, ideally even 1.45 million students, that will be a challenge given the debate on sustainability in mobility. So that brings me back to digital formats. Uh, what we need to do is find an intelligent mix of physical mobility, digital formats, hybrid formats, and to combine them in a wise way so that in those contexts where it is really needed, physical encounters are made possible. Um, and in all the other uh, contexts, we use alternative ways. So this is a huge challenge for us. How can we provide international experience to as many students as possible on the one hand? And on the other, how can we, more, and how can we become more sustainable about mobility with many more students? Um, so this is this is a real challenge for all of us, and I think that warrants international uh, cooperation as a topic as well. Um, for example, between South Asia, India in particular, and Germany, 
um, how to go about um, this very complex situation in, in the years to come. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And you can't even put 37 million Indian students in a plane and move them around the world. Uh, so the, the added challenges are even higher given the numbers of the Indian, Indian uh, system. Um, Professor Kamaka, I get a question in here, and I think it's a very relevant question. We've talked about yeah, access to, to international education on an individual level, uh, but also for, for universities and on, on, on equity and internationalization, democratization. Wouldn't be there an unhealthy competition given the, the numbers of the system in India, for instance? So we have more than 1,000 universities, more than 40,000 colleges. Uh, how we cope then and would not that lead to an unhealthy comp competition based on uh, the best wins with the most of the money? That's true, basically. When you look at uh, the Indian Indian sort of uh, education system, especially the public state universities, uh, wherein the student actually come from uh, economically weaker section as such. Uh, so that way actually provide, uh, to provide him an international education is always very challenging and this and until basically some kind of financial support is provided mentally or uh, knowledge wise they're good. But sometimes on their own, they cannot afford to go to any foreign country as such. So unless and until there is a there is a such kind of exchange program as it used to be previously, for example, the Rasmus Mundus or many, many of those kind, including the DAT program as such. Probably these are the ways by which uh, uh, this kind of a problem can uh, this kind of a problem can be addressed, the equity basically. Uh, that is how you can address it. Otherwise, it is very difficult, basically, for those students uh, coming from weaker section or from down round section as such, for them to get uh, international education in a physical form, going abroad and doing it so. Yeah, thank you so much. I get a couple of questions in regarding possibilities of cooperation with German universities, DLE funding. I would uh, request those. Have a look in our tool. There's B2B matchmaking of the next days possible. There are universities, more than 40 German universities on, who are there who would like to talk to you. And there is also our DAD colleagues are there. You could yeah, reach out to them, also colleagues from the German Research Foundation, the German I, I have seen. So maybe you take the opportunity in the next three days to, to connect and have one-to-one -one meetings with them, 15 minutes. I think uh, that would be very useful if you would look into these, uh, these questions. So slowly, our very interesting discussion, I have to say, come to an end. So that leads me to the final statements of our three esteemed panelists here. So and maybe media ladies first. What would you say an international university in 2030 is? Point, point, point. An international university in 2030 would be a borderless university where students from different parts of the world will be either physically or virtually present. Uh, and so that you instill a, a, a sense of global citizenship amongst each and every student of the university. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Bukachi, the question, of course, goes also to you. What does an international university in 20, a successful international university in 23 look like? Well, a successful international university um, today already should um, have um, network of strategic partners worldwide with joint projects, joint activities, um, possibly also joint degree programs, um, should also accept its, its responsibility for the education of truly global citizens, um, and should understand strategic partnerships not as, as a, you know, as a partnership where it's only about um, gaining funding, but it's about the shared responsibility for this planet, for the education of our students, and for pursuing projects that are in the interest of mankind. And uh, if this, these, these, I would say, are the characteristics of a successful international university. And when I frame it this way, then I also would like to reiterate that it's not a matter of ranking. Whether a university is internationally successful or successful at internationalization it has nothing to do with ranking. It has to do with one's own mission and the way this mission is fulfilled. 
Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kramalka. Where do you see the University of Pune in 2030 in matters of internationalization? Yeah, so I, I totally agree with Vitya Ji. Basically, as she mentioned, that it is a borderless or it is a wallless university, university without walls. So, so there is a, a great connectivity that is happening, and you are choosing the right partners, strategic partners, uh, expanding basically your am ambit as such. And we actually have slowly. Uh, um, gather that momentum as such uh, uh, with the Melbourne, perhaps with uh, the Cali California University, or maybe with the Drexel, or many more, in fact, partners with whom, uh, uh, since the new education pool of, uh, policy provide this particular opportunity, a twine degree or dual degree, uh, that perhaps is a feasibility. And therefore, I feel that uh, get, gaining more partnership, and that is what we are actually signing more number of MOUs and not there men only for signing it was a, a, not, not a tick mark activity, actually working MOU, wherein there's a exchange of ideas, exchange of students, exchange of research, as well as basically exchange of uh, knowledge that has been happening as such. And that uh, we actually are trying to design such curriculum, which is a blended in nature. So basically where the, there's the involvement of the international partner, while creating that particular cu curriculum so that basically he gets that sense of belonging and then he directly gets involved into it. And that is what I'm looking at by 2030, perhaps we will have more number of basically uh, research institutions as well as universities associated with the University of Pune and not necessarily we are confining ourselves only to the Pune region. But yes, we already have made our uh, uh, this thing put abroad that we are starting our sub campus at Qatar in in um, in, in uh, um, another month's time. So that is how basically perhaps uh, we are trying to uh, go internationally always. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So thanks to the panelists for this inspiring discussion. I just we could just yeah. I tackle a couple of problems here, not going into that. That shows that there is a huge interest, and I think we should continue uh, this, the discussion. We have discussed in this conference over the last days several aspects of internationalization. We discussed how to bound inbound international mobility. We discussed alumni networks. We looked into Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh today, just an hour before. Uh, we had a look at mobility changing patterns uh, and how the, they changed since the 1960s. But we discussed also democratization of international education and, of course, the pandemic, uh, which is uh, still there and, and present. So I think the conference and uh, the conference is not over yet, as we have the matchmaking ahead of us, uh, has shown the huge interest. And uh, what my takeaway is uh, from today's panel, but also from the uh, other discussions we had over the last two days, that we should continue the discussion on internationalization, on strategic internationalization. To, to enter this field, maybe in, on a regional level, um, there was a request from Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh for more exchange um, to, yeah, to discuss together to take uh, the region of South Asia uh, forward. So thanks a lot for your time today. Thanks a lot uh, to the audience for the questions. Uh, it was a very inspiring uh, discussion. I'm looking forward to the next three days. So it's no time to head for meetings. So it's time to virtually get up. Maybe have a look in the tool. We have more than 500 participants uh, registered. Reach out to them. You can ask them for one-to-one -one meetings uh, over the next three days, uh, four hours each day. I tomorrow have eight meetings, I have to say, with, German, <laughs> with Indian universities. There are German universities. There are universities from Bangladesh, 10 of them, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and Nepal to enhance interregional cooperation. And there are also funding agencies on the tool, like Araxis and the, um, uh, DART, of course, but also the uh, German Research Foundation. So thanks a lot for joining in. Thanks a lot for the panel and for your wonderful contributions. I wish you all a nice week ahead. Uh, and yeah, see you hopefully soon also in person, if not in person, then virtually, and hopefully con continuing the discussion on internationalization of higher education uh, and connecting Germany and South Asia. So take care and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.